So this is my usual going over um, not the things you actually need to know for doing the Unit 4 essay assignment, but rather just the things you need to talk about. So I'm going to just go through really quickly why, what you need to talk about and why. Um, and then since uh, we could all use a little more incentive these days, it seems, uh, to hang in there all the way till the end. Um, I wanted to show you something fun, and I don't know too many fun things, but I do know how to escape from handcuffs when you don't have a key, and, you know, that's fun. So I'll tell you that at the end. All right, so first off, the essay prompt, which I, of course, don't have in front of me, but it says something like, set out the best argument uh, for a company, um, Huli is my imaginary company, uh, set out the best argument, you know, f that Huli has a right to profit from the things that they learn by doing a bunch of analytics on customers uh, or users' um, personal data. So that's the first part. We need to explain we why owning something should give you a right to use it, which hopefully sounds trivial, although we'll see in a second, you need to talk a little bit more about that than you might think. Um, and once we've done that, then I want you to do the usual thing, which is raise a problem for it. And I want you to raise a particular problem, which comes from uh, Sachs's article. Um, he gives several responses to this, and there's just one that I want you to focus on, so we'll talk about that. Okay, so first, um, the question is sort of like, you know, if you, if you have a right um, to own something, or sorry, if you have ownership of something, to own something just means that you have a bunch of rights. So you have a right to sell the thing if you want it generally, uh, you have rights to destroy it, um, you have rights to sort of prohibit uh, trespasses, which is, you know, other people from touching it, and all sorts of things like that. That's the basic idea of a property right. So when we say that you own something, we're saying that you have a certain set of rights and those rights confer kind of a moral status uh, that expands outward, all right? So in order to explain why Huli should have, um, you know, so it has all this data, right? And then it does a bunch of, you know, analytics on it. And, oops, and the analytics give them insights, right? So we, the usual case is um, we're able to notice using machine learning techniques and whatnot that there are patterns in customer behavior uh, which are potentially valuable to the customers, to the medical profession, to people who want to advertise to them, to all sorts of different entities. So the thought is that Huli wants to be able to sell off the stuff it learns, that it's learned by doing all this analytics on this data that is about people. And the about people thing is the important part, right? Because if we were just talking about, you know, sort of like weather data, right? Um, if we've got, you know, sort of like, I just set up in my backyard a, um, a thermometer, you know, something, uh, something for pressure. I'm doing really good on the nice handwriting today, you know, and wind, right? If some company wanted to say be predicting uh, temperatures in specific areas of North Hollywood, they might buy this information off of me and then, you know, run some analytics on it and figure out sort of how the temperature is likely to be in the future. And they have every right, it would seem, to sell that, those insights off. There's no sort of worry that seems unique there. But when we're talking about data that is about people, and remember that's the basic definition of personal data, is that it's about people, it's linkable to people. Um, that might be a little bit more difficult. And so in fact, I didn't write it here, but you probably, one of the first things you wanna do is talk about what we mean by personal data. You don't have to go into a lot of depth, but you just wanna make sure that it's clear what we're talking about, okay? So, the usual thought is, well, why is it that a company can do, you know, can make money off of stuff that it has possession of? Well, usually it's because the company owns that stuff and usually owning something for the most part means that we have a right to go and do what with, do with it as we please, 
subject to, um, you know, you can't kill people, well, you know, those usual requirements. Um, and by the way, side note, property rights are never like sort of exist in nature, right? They're always within a society, always within a system of norms and laws and stuff like that. So important to keep in mind. All right, so we know that Huli has this personal data, it's got some insights. And the first thought we have is, well, it should be able to sell that those insights off because it owns them, right? Or it owns the data underneath it. And that seems plausible, but we wanna make sure that we look we kind of spell that out and make sure we're clear about what it actually means. So what you want to do is pick one of these accounts, either the lock account or the Kersner account. Sachs talks about the Kersner account. Um, there are reasons to be very suspicious of this account, or at least to think that it doesn't come to much that's different from this one. So whichever one you want to go with, um, both of them are in the lecture notes. Uh, your first task is to just spell that out to say, okay, so on a Lockean view, here's what it is to own something, or here's when you actually have ownership rights over something. Here's when something is your property. And here's what that means, right? Or you do the Kersner version, okay? Uh, so for lock, it's, you know, you mix your labor with some unowned resource, or you have, uh, somebody has transferred something that they created to you, okay? For Kersner, it's a little more, tricky because in some cases what you create is something of value that didn't exist before and you own it because you created it. All right, so you pick one of those accounts, spell it out, and then apply it to the Huli case, right? So this that part shouldn't be too hard. You should just be able to say, okay, so here's, if we're doing the Lockean thing, you know, Lock needs to be doing work on some non-owned resource. Okay, so the data, you know, looks like that's the resource. The analytics or the programming of the computer that does the analytics or the pain for the server that runs the computer or runs the algorithm that does the analytics, whatever it is, one of those things is, you know, you want to say that's the kind of work that creates the right to have the thing and having the thing means that you get to sell it. Okay, now, or you do the similar thing with the Kersner type argument, either way. But you want to, as you set this up, kind of be thinking, you know, what's the next move? So remember I just said for lock, um, what we're worried about in, and not worried, but in uh, the main way that you get sort of a property right going in the first place, right, is you take an unknown, uh, unknown resource, I cannot spell today, and, you know, you mix your labor with it, okay? So you'll notice if you spell it out in this way, right? And then you say, okay, well, here is the, here is the labor, here is the resource, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you wanna kind of set it up to help yourself on the next part because you say, well, wait a second. Remember, this isn't just any resource. It's something that's just hanging out there, right? Or it's, it's something that's gotta be brand new that nobody actually owns, at least on the traditional locking approach. And this is, by the way, why Kersner has a different view because I think he wants to avoid that kind of um, problem, but it gets him into a different problem as we talk about in the lecture notes. Okay, so you would say for lock, this is what you need. That gets you the right and we're doing pretty good. You know, you kind of like make sure it's clear that this is gonna be important, right? And now we can move on to the next part, which is setting out the problem for this kind of account, okay? Um, in his paper, Sachs goes through a whole bunch of different things. Um, I just want you to focus on the one, which is the one that has to do with the nature of um, personal data, right? So these are, he calls all these um, divisibility, or not all of them, sorry. The ones I want you to talk about, he calls divisibility, or he says it, they require, it requires a certain kind of divisibility or something like that. And the thought is that, you know, if you have a person, right, and you've got the data that's about the person, there better be, it better be possible to separate the two. If you want an argument why, very simple. Um, remember, we're talking about ownership, right? Okay, so if the whole point is that Huli is supposed to own the data, um, and that's what gives them the right, well, you can't own people. I hope that's pretty clear to everybody. So if it turns out that you can't actually divide like this, you can't separate a person from her data, then 
there's going to be a huge problem, right? Because it's not even the sort of thing that could be owned, right? So that's one way to set this up. There's a couple of other possibilities, but that's the way I usually talk about it. Okay, so we've said how we get the, the right. We've said why there might be a problem, right? So the problem is, would be that we need to uh, be able to separate between a person and her data if this kind of scheme is going to work. All right, well, that, we don't yet have an objection. We just start pointing out, like, look, you know, you better be able to draw a line. But that seems kind of intuitively easy to do, right? Because what is data? Data is, you know, facts. Or if you're going to be careful about it, it's a representation of a fact, right? <clears throat> um, whereas a person is, a, you know, a person. Uh, two different things. But that's where uh, Sachs brings in um, who I sort of affectionately call the class's favorite uh, madman uh, because, you know, his views are, well, he thinks outside of the box. Let's leave it at that for a second. So Flaherty, come, Sachs brings Flaherty's view about the nature of personal data in to help show that there's no way of separating between the person and her data. Because for Flor Flaherty, um, the person is her data, right? And this, you know, this isn't supposed to be, as far as I can tell, metaphorical or, you know, sort of figurative. That's a literal equal sign. You, what you are is your data. That's Flaherty's view. And you can see if that that's actually what's going on, then you're not going to be able to draw this nice line between a person and her data. That, that means that the, the data can't be a sort of unowned thing, or it can't even be an own thing in the first place. So that means that this whole scheme that depends on ownership isn't going to work. Okay, so something along those lines, different ways to go. Uh, up to you to think through some of the details there. And the details, of course, do matter. Uh, as always, it's philosophy. And then the last thing I want you to do is the usual thing, which is, you know, um, so you've set out kind of like, here's how this picture is supposed to work. Uh oh, here's the wrinkle that seems to cause some problems. Um, it depends on on this picture of uh, our ability to divide people's um, personal data from the people. And the last thing I want you to do then is to sort of assess this and, you know, the, do the usual, like ask some questions and figure out whether there are some problems here. Again, as always, you don't have to be right. What you have to do is, fig is set out your, your kind of reasoning as clearly as you can so somebody else could can follow it and you know you want to do as good a job as you can so somebody else might be convinced by it okay so lots of different ways you can go here um one thing i want you to do um i hope this is clear in the question i'm not sure i wrote it i struggled a bit to try to make this clear and i just kind of gave up because it wasn't working and i needed to get you something um but one really um i think useful way to, th to go at this is to think about um, the anonymization stipulation that, that I sort of put in the question. Remember, I said, set up the question to say that suppose that Huli is somehow able to actually, you know, sort of outsmart every, every computer scientist that we have right now and actually make the data set uh, anonymous. So the idea would be, you know, you start with your database, right? You've got, you know, records, you know, stuff, right? So you've got, you know, uh, Adam, Jill, Jorge, you know, Mike, right? Uh, you know, and then you've got stuff in your database. So the kind of naive way of doing this is just to think, well, okay, you just keep the IDs, which are just numbers, and just get rid of that and keep and keep this and you're good. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So that's what you, you know, kind of the na naive way of thinking about anonymizing, but it's too easy to actually get back to this by noticing all sorts of patterns and whatnot that occur within the, the substantive data. So I stipulated that 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 Huli is able to overcome that problem and they can actually keep it anonymous. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that Flaherty 
has to be wrong, it seems, right? Because, or sorry, it ha it means, actually, that's not what it means. There's a couple of things it could mean. <laughs> one is that it could, one thing is that it could mean that 4D is wrong, right? That it is possible to separate people from their data. But remember his claim, 4D's claim isn't a sort of like a claim about like, can computer scientists figure out how to do this, uh, do this, you know, anonymize. Um, Flirty's claim is that, no, if you think about what a person is, you're going to come to the conclusion that a person is a collection of data. And it doesn't matter sort of how, whether or not you know who the person is. It just matters that you know what the data is because you're still in contact with the person and you can't fully separate them like that. So what I want you to think through, or I'm leaving it open. There's several things you could work on here when you're trying to decide whether Sachs's objection works. But the way I'm talking about right now is to think about sort of what kind of anonymity we would really need in order to get around what Flaherty is claiming. Okay. So Flaherty, you know, could still stick to his guns and say, well, you know, even if nobody's ever going to know what this data is, it's still about you. But that could be true and still not a problem, right? Because it could be true that um, the data is, uh, well, let me put it this way. It could be true that what we care about is not somebody else having, the, having facts about us in their database. What could be true is them having facts and being able to connect those back to us, right? So Flirty is saying, okay, you can never separate these things. That might be true, but it could be true, but that's consistent with us being able to hide the person in there. And you might think then, well, why would we care, right? If it's, you know, by stipulation, this has been done perfectly. We're never gonna be able to work back and figure out who the person is. You know, we just know somebody out there is 200 pounds on Tuesday, right? We don't know who it is. We just know somebody. Um, is that enough? Is that enough for us to be able to make sense of the claim that they that the company owns the products of the in, of the uh, analysis they do on the personal data? Okay, so a bunch of different ways you can go. Um, you could just go head on with Flirty and just try to you know figure out the whether the metaphysics even makes sense. I would not really suggest that because. Um, his view is very complicated. <laughs> Let me tell you that. I spent a lot of time thinking it through and um, still not, I still don't think I totally get it, but it's pretty complicated, so I wouldn't go that way. Instead, my suggestion, just to finish up here, my suggestion is to think about sort of, could we still have, or, you know, could Huli still have everything they want, even though we can't actually separate these two? if it was possible to sort of hide the person, right? So in thinking about, put it a different way, sort of like, what do we actually care about? And what would matter for our, the notion of ownership that we've invoked in answering this question? Okay, so there's, once you're, as usual, once you're to the end of the, in, into this part, as I would think of it, the fun part of the paper, there's not a right answer here. Um, I'm always happy to read an answer and go, holy, I, I didn't think of that before, right? That's great. That's my favorite thing about being a teacher. Uh, well, one of them. Um, there are better and worse ways to go, of course, though. But what matters is that you just try to spell out your thinking as best you can. And if you run into a problem, you know, you're like, oh, I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say this, this, and this. And you get to the last thing, you're like, oh, crap, that doesn't work totally fine. You know, as uh, Gavin Lawrence told me back when I was an undergrad, um, if that happens, you just go back to the beginning. Instead of saying, I'm going to show X, Y, and Z, you just go back and change that first sentence to say, you might have thought X, Y, and Z was true, but I will show you that you'll be wrong. Okay, so I hope this helps. Um, now I'll show you something totally, well, I'll show you something slightly related to class because, and I think this is defensible in terms of class content, because we are talking a little bit about, and actually a lot about, um, security.
So let me be clear that nothing I'm telling you here is illegal, um, and let me urge you that if you are supposed to be in handcuffs, uh, if a law enforcement officer or some authorized person like that has put you in handcuffs, getting yourself out of them is going to be uh, make your day way worse than it already was. You should not be doing that. And more to the point, all the things I'm going to show you right now are basically day one of handcuff school at the LAPD. So cops know this. There's ways that they make this way more difficult. So don't worry about that. Okay. So standard pair of handcuffs, you've seen them before. I don't know why you need to get out of handcuffs, but just supposing you need to because you have lost the key. All right, just to show you, these are real handcuffs. They work uh, just like that, okay? Um, now, I'll show you, what I'll show you today is how to open it with a shim, which means that it will not work if the handcuffs have been double locked, like that. So let's talk first about how the handcuffs work. Okay, there's a serrated guy there. There's another guy, serrated thing right there. It's a little hard to see because of the light. There we go. And when you turn the key, it just moves the that guy out of the way and lets this go through. Okay, so in order to open this without a key, it's locked, right? You just take something flat and you push down that little um, uh, serrated guy on the inside, and there you are. All right, you, I'm here using a piece of a windshield wiper blade. It's actually a tension ridge for white lock picking, but same thing. Um, you could do the same thing uh, with a paper 